All right. Welcome to uh, the first Q&A of 2022. And um, I'm Pastor Mike Winger. I'm here to answer your questions live to the best of my ability anyways. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I know you don't think I have all the answers. Most of you, the, the wise of you know that about me without me telling you. Um, but I'm going to try to give you the best answers I've got to the questions you have, pointing you specifically to the Bible for those answers. That's the main agenda here. So I'm um, sorry for my delayed beginning. I was just having some tech things I had to work through. But I think we're good to go. So the first question today comes in um, anonymously, and it says, Hi, Pastor Mike. I've been pretty terrible with reading my Bible in past years, and I really want to stay in God's Word this year and always. Can you please give me some advice on how to read my Bible consistently? I always start reading plans, fall behind, then just stop reading altogether and find myself totally apart from the Word. Thank you. Uh, let me give you several thoughts here as I kind of work through these same issues in my own heart. And so many of us have experienced it like you're not alone at all. I mean, how many of us here are like, yeah, that's I mean, struggle with reading the Bible as, as much as I, I want to, as much as I think would be would be healthy or more importantly, just regularly, just to have it as a regular part of your life. And um, one of the things I'd recommend is is to consider um, Bible reading plans can be good, but they can also be bad. Uh, a Bible reading plan that has you reading the Bible where you feel like you're getting behind. And after like, say, a few days of not following the plan, there's this mountain of reading that you have to catch up to, to be part of, to, basically, this is encouraging you to quit now, instead of just pick up and start reading again. So by having um, these sort of rigid plans that are inflexible, you end up encouraging your own quitting. That's just something, at least in my own experience, I've I've felt... Also, you know, biblically speaking, we don't have any kind of regulated amount that God tells us to read the Bible. Okay, there's no specific number of verses or chapters or times, you know, during the week where we're supposed to do that. But there is obviously, biblically thinking about these things, this incredible value in the Word of God, th this, this immeasurable treasure that we have in Scripture. Psalm 119 is what I'd recommend you read if you're thinking that the Word of God is not valuable for your life personally. If you're like, ah, do I really need to? Is this really important for me? Please read Psalm 119. Yes, it's the longest psalm in the Bible. Um, but it's all about the value of God's word in our lives and the blessings it brings to us. And so, yes, it keeps you it keeps you pure. It, it focuses your heart upon Christ. It teaches you the truths of God that will enable you to make decisions and deal with spiritual warfare. Jesus, in his, in his discussions with Satan, when Satan tries to tempt him, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy over and over again as a way of uh, overcoming those lies and those temptations. And, uh, or I should say, ref, ref, refuting them. And uh, I wonder if, if I had to quote Deuteronomy to overcome my spiritual battle, would I be able to? <laughs> you know, that's that's what I'm saying is like there's a great blessing in it. But here are some some problems that you may have as you read, you read the Bible, why it's harder for you than it needs to be. Um, one is you are used to devotionals. By devotionals, I mean, I remember when my youth pastor, back when I first was, you know, walking with the Lord, my youth pastor asked me to um, do a devotional for the church, for the youth group. And I said, yes, I'd love to. And then I walked away and I thought, what's a devotional? I don't know what that is. And I was like really struggling with just figuring out what he meant by it. And I was too embarrassed to ask because yeah, probably just pride. But at any rate, what we experience in church is these often these devotional moments, right? Where, where somebody opens the Bible and they bring a particular verse or passage out and they already have like this prepackaged application, this really effective, impactful application. I do this all the time in Bible studies with you. I say, here's application. Um, but when you open the Bible and you just start reading, if you're expecting that experience every time, you have an expectation for kind of like a fast food treatment of scripture. But often when you open the Bible to read it on your own, what you're doing is less like fast food and more like home cooking. And home cooking can take all day. Home cooking can take a lot of prep. So, you know, you get the steak and you marinate it overnight and then you get it over here and you have the things and you cook the thing and you bake it and you prepare all the ingredients. That's more like what's happening when you're reading on your own. It's not prepared for you. You are now digging in. So don't have a devotional expectation that every time you read the Bible, you're going to get these like warm fuzzies, like these nice feelings or this, this like thing where after you leave that devotional time, you feel like God has spoken to you freshly. I don't think you should expect that. I don't, I do not think you should expect that. I don't think there's anything in scripture that says that every time you open the Bible, you will sense that God sp spoke to you freshly. And that expectation creates a sense of disappointment when you, what you were doing was you were just preparing the ingredients, 
that later you would discover these imp impactful and important things. You were storing up knowledge that later, maybe a year down the road, that verse comes back, that idea comes back, that truth comes back and saves you from error or from a problem. I also think one of our problems with um, reading the Bible is that we, um, we don't read whole books of the Bible. We just read parts. I'm just trying to read a chunk, a random chunk. I, we, we, we would open, I'm looking for a Bible. I've got, I got like four of them up, up there out of my reach, but oh, here's one. <laughs> we would open up the Bible um, and just start reading a random section looking for God to speak to us. Again, that's the devotional problem. You're looking for fast food, but you should be preparing ingredients, studying the passage, reading it, thinking about it. Um, but you should read whole books. And I don't think when it comes to Psalms, you need to do that or Proverbs, you need to do that. But you won't, you won't understand Ecclesiastes unless you read the whole book. You won't understand the teachings of Jesus in the Gospel of John nearly as well when you just read one of them versus when you read the entire Gospel. Uh, First Timothy, and you, you, need, you need to read the whole thing. I'm not saying you have to read it all in one day, although that's great, but you need to read whole books. We also um, don't have general perspective on Scripture. And here's one of the helps you should have is, you know, like a, a simple study Bible that has like a little introduction you know, just, just pick a study Bible. Don't be too paranoid about it. Pick a mainstream study Bible, mainstream translation with a study Bible that comes with it. And, and just read the introduction to the book before you read the book, because it gives you some necessary background that will really help you a lot. I think one of our biggest issues though is, um, and this is probably the biggest issue is you don't feel like reading the Bible. Like this is what I'm going to encourage you. Anonymous person, you're like me. Okay. So this is, I'm saying this to you and me. The reason, the main reason why you don't read the Bible is because you don't feel like it. And because you find yourself not doing things you don't feel like doing. That's probably something that affects your life in a lot of different ways, as it does mine, as it does everybody listening. Part of being a disciplined Christian, being a disciple of Christ and engaging in disciplines is doing things you don't feel like. This is a glorious and wonderful and adult and mature and Christ honoring thing is you just do stuff you don't feel like doing. <laughs> That's my encouragement to you. Um, you just, you just have to do it even though you don't feel like it. I mean, that that's the bottom line. That's, that's going to happen tomorrow when you wake up. If you, you know, obviously you should be wise on setting when you're going to read scripture, thinking about how it's going to happen. Um, I highly recommend listening to the Bible on audio. I highly recommend that. Um, but, but if it doesn't happen, it's more often than not because you just didn't feel like it. Some of us are in such busy times that literally the only time you have is in the car on your way to work and back. Well, that's when you could do audio Bible, something like that. So, Let's go to question number two, and this comes from Judah Matthews, uh, who's been a longtime viewer. Judah, I recognize your, uh, your, your name there. Um, did Levitical sacrifices really do anything beyond point to Jesus? Because of Hebrews 10.4 and Romans 3.25, we know Jesus' atonement was applied retroactively to Old Testament saints, so were their sacrifices only symbolic? Let's look at those two verses and we'll talk about this. Hebrews 10, 4, what impact did these Old Testament sacrifices have? For it is possible that, it is not possible, excuse me, that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. That's that's the statement here. It's not possible that the blood of these animals could take away sins. Um, so, Hebrews, okay, this is again one verse out of a larger teaching section in Hebrews, but I'm going to do verse by verse through Hebrews this year. I will be digging into it starting this year, and so we'll get into all this in detail. But for now, just to say this, Hebrews is definitely saying that that old covenant, there was some lack in it. There was some insufficiency in it to cover people's sins, and, and yet God gave it to them, and the language of the Old Testament is that it does cover sin. So how do we, how do we reconcile these issues? Um, I don't think what Hebrews is ultimately teaching, this is my, my opinion, give, give some thought to this, form your opinion about it. I don't think what Hebrews is ultimate, ultimately teaching is that um, in every way that the Old Testament um, law with sacrifices had no effect. I think what it's teaching is that apart from Christ, it is of no effect. That the blood of bulls and goats in and of itself doesn't do anything. It's not going to remove sin. It's not going to take away sins. But that through Christ, we have the fulfillment of that. So now let's say that you don't know about Jesus in detail yet, but you're that faithful Jew who is trusting in this, this, this process God gave you in the Old Testament law, and you're believing in God and you're performing the sacrifices. By virtue of Jesus, like you said, retroactively, by virtue of Jesus, you are being covered because you're responding to God in faith. And the outward expression of it is the sacrifices. They're not literally taking care of your sins. Jesus is the ultimate one who will be doing that. 
Um, Romans 3.25, we'll talk a, a little bit about the benefit of that. This is the other verse you brought up. Um, that Jesus is the one whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate righteousness. Because, and here let's talk about the past, in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I think that um, this is this sins that were previously committed is not just talking about Jewish sins, but rather all mankind's sins throughout history. God has patiently been waiting to provide for us that we might come to know him, that we might be forgiven. He has not judged the world yet because he wants to save the world more. And um, uh, then let me read your question and make sure I've answered it. Uh, did Levitical sacrifices really do anything beyond point to Jesus? Um, uh I, I guess I could I could answer the question is my opinion would be no they didn't do anything beyond point to Jesus in the sense of salvation right the bringing salvation to people they pointed to Jesus in a lot of ways though right it gave something for the for the for the believing Jew to respond to right in, in the real time that would help them be aware of and be prepared for the gospel of Christ it helped them to demonstrate that reality to others so it points to Jesus in some very big and powerful and, and life transforming ways. Um, the sacrifices did other things because they also helped deal with the conscience, right? The, 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 the Jewish person who's, who sinned, who partakes of the sacrifice says, okay, I'm dealt with, I'm dealt with, right? So it helps deal with that sense of conscious, conscience, consciousness of sin, but the continued ongoing sacrifices creates a con constant awareness of continued sin issues. Jesus, he dies for us once that we might know we are totally forgiven we are currently, right now, right with God because of the one thing Jesus did. But again, I'm, I'm just preaching Hebrews now. So um, so their sacrifices were, um, you, you say they were only symbolic. They have other issues they, that, that are beyond just symbolism. They, they, they give the, the community of the Jewish people an identity. They help them be different than the religious practices of the world around them. They help them to set aside the, the, the uh, pagan worship because they have worship that's focused on God, that all pictures Christ. So without the full awareness of Christ, they're able to separate and, you know, be holy unto God through those things. So it has a lot of effects on the community. I'm sure there's other things too that I'm just I'm not thinking of. Number three, Jay Parker says, a lot of people in my circle talk about being under the covering and authority of their pastor and elders. Is this a thing? Um... I'm trying to, I mean, I don't think so. <laughs> um, there's a sense in which there's a truth there. Is the terminology though correct? Does the Bible use the term covering for being in submission to your leaders, uh, your, your local pastors? And I think the answer, the answer there is no, not that I'm aware of. I, I can't think of anywhere where that happens. The closest thing we have in scripture is um, the uh, a, a wife and her husband being, being being in this relationship where the wife is is uh, positioned like in yielding and submission like a headship relationship with her husband but I don't think that individual members of the church are called to yield to their pastoral leaders the way that a marriage is represented that's a very intimate and very deep thing um, I think rather what we have with with pastoral leaders is we have like a certain authority to like say excommunicate and by that I just mean it's a fan, it's a too big of a word to be honest but to like tell people your unrepentant sin issues are hurting yourself hurting your relationship with Christ and hurting the church and we want you to come in but until you repent of those issues you can't you can't come in so they have like kind of this community authority that's there but I don't think that they're meant to have a for instance if you feel like you have to get your pastor's approval on who you will marry, something's wrong. If you feel like you have to get your pastor's approval on what car you're going to buy, something is wrong. Like I, th this is not a type of, of authority that somebody I think is supposed to have in your life. Um, the types of decisions that a, a couple makes for their, for their family, for themselves, they don't need to run it by their pastor. Like if you were to, to move out of town or go from one church to another, you don't need your pastor's permission. Although you may want it, you may want their blessing as you go. You don't need that. You're not in rebellion. One of the issues that we have in the church is um, that Christ wants us to have, and I think this is a very serious issue, 
Christ wants us to have authorities in the church, local leaders that do have real authority. Um, Hebrews talks about they're the ones that they watch out for your souls and that don't make it hard for them and that we should be yielding to authority. But what we also have is Jesus himself being deeply aware that as soon as man is in authority, manipulation and abuse of that authority comes into play, which is why he tells them, don't lord it over each other like the Gentiles. No, serve one another. And so um, while I want to affirm church authority and affirm pastoral leadership or eldership, some people don't like the term pastor. I think it's just a synonym for elder in the scriptures. So that eldership, the elder leaders in the local body, I think they need to be there and they need to have a, an authority but that that authority constantly has to be curbed by the limitations Jesus put on us. Don't be like the Gentiles who lord it over each other. You know, be the servant of all. Be those be those who are exercising your authority to bless and help others. And you're not worried about your reputation, your, your power. Um, you use minimal force, so to speak, as a leader at all times. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think those are important things. So I say this. Um, having spent a lot of years in the body of Christ now and knowing that people who talk about, well, you're not under the covering of your pastor, they tend to be these abusive situations. I'm just being straight with y'all. Doesn't mean you need to hate the church and hate the leaders. Just recognize the problem and don't duplicate it in your own life. Uh, number four, Forever Mel says, Hi, Pastor Mike. It seems like the more I try to teach my kids the word, um, ages 8 and 12 years, the more they say the Bible's boring and groan every time I want to read with them, getting discouraged. Suggestions? Um, so, um, get used to it. <laughs> um, it's not like your kids think that all learning is interesting except the Bible. <laughs> so this is, this is kind of a human thing. Um, what I would say is you, you might not, okay, I'm just giving you throwing an option out there. This is not an accusation, but it's an opportunity for us to really seriously just ask. You may not be very good at teaching kids biblical things, in which case that's not like you have to kick yourself for this. Find people who are right. Find resources that are those who are good at this. Um, I'd recommend if you want to talk about that age group um, that you check out. Um, let me make sure I get the website right. I think it's biblical foundations. Is that right? No, this does not look right. I don't even know what website that is. Now, the person I'm thinking of, I'll think of it later. <laughs> I have an interview on my channel um, for this ministry, and um, I'll, I'll think of I'm just totally spacing on it right now. I just I haven't had enough coffee. It'll come to me. Anyways, I'd recommend you check out some of these other resources because your your communication with your kids, especially you, like I've I've a a relative who's an incredible musician, and their kid is learning the same instrument that this person knows professionally, like professionally, not just they're really good, but they know it professionally, like you'd be hired to do gigs and has been for this instrument, and they've hired somebody else to teach their kid this instrument. See, it's not even there about knowledge and ability. It's sometimes about the relationship, parent and child. So um, with a parent, it's sometimes helpful to bring in others to help you with these things as well. You're still responsible for teaching your kids, but be creative about it. Be thinking about it. Learn from them on what, where's the balance between you're bored, so what? We're going to push through this. You know, that's just part of you growing up and learning, you know, to do things you don't feel like doing versus the other side of yeah but I'm not I'm not I'm not actually getting the truth across to them I'm not I'm not getting it to them in a way that clicks for them so I, I would look for resources on that um yeah but I mean so much of parenting is is finding the balance of when to just make your kids do things versus uh when to yield and uh those are tough tough choices C Sites has a question it says if I lacked repentance at the time of my baptism years ago as a teen should I be rebaptized now as an adult? The past year I've experienced true heartfelt repentance and now just want to obey. Um, uh, I, I think this is a decision, okay, as a pastor who's, I've dealt with people who they're in those, those same shoes. I dealt with someone who maybe, maybe I baptized or maybe uh, the most awkward was like their parent baptized them at the age of like seven. And then at like 17, they're like serious about following Christ, real life transformation. Like, wow, life is different now. 
And then they come and they go, I want to be baptized. And now there's, it's awkward because it's been like a personal connection with the parent. Um, uh, you know, they baptized this, this child, uh, the parent was a ministry leader. And then should I do this or not? And, and my focus tends to be at this point, okay, here's, here's kind of a gray area, right? There, there's, I mean, you only need to be baptized once. It's not like you have to be baptized multiple times. The question isn't whether baptism is legit or whether it was done properly by those who performed it. It's the person you're, like yourself who's saying, but was I just going through the motions then? Was that a genuine commitment to Christ? Um, and if you're not sure, as, as the pastor, I'm going to yield to you to make this decision. It's not going to hurt you to be baptized again. Maybe for the first time in a genuine sense. It won't harm you. And so I want to alleviate those those leftover tensions of feeling like, oh, but I felt like my heart wasn't right. and I, So I'm willing to do that. But I'm not going to be going telling everyone to go do it either. Um, so yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that if this is going to be on your mind and bothering you and bothering you, that you at least talk to your a local leader in your fellowship and tell them how you're feeling about it and perhaps move forward and do that again just for your own sake. And um, I think the Lord understands. Amber Ribeiro has a question. And before I get to that, I'll just let you guys know. Um, it's been like weeks since you've seen anything from me online. And I've took, a, I, well, I, I got a little sick. I also took some time off, which was very rejuvenating for me. Reju, rejuven, rejuvenation <laughs> was, was taking place. And um, I'm very happy for that. And um, I'm digging deep now back again, you know, doing all the women in ministry stuff. This is one of the resources I'm looking at, one of the many. And I'm excited to, to be able to present that stuff to you whenever it gets done. I have a mountain still. There's just, it's, it's like a mountain range studying this thing. Uh, but during that same time where I was taking a little bit of time off, part of it was just working, part was time off, part was sick. Uh, my wife also got fairly sick, but Sarah Zimmerman, the assistant, my assistant, you know, she got really ill, like bad. She got dangerously sick with COVID and you've been praying for her. And I posted for people to pray for her. And just as an update, she is recovering. She's home. She's actually working again now, mostly regular amounts uh, when she can. And she's just a very slow recovery. She got it really bad. It was, it was scary. It was scary. It was, it reminded me of Paul and Epaphroditus when Paul was like, I left him sick in Miletus and um, and he was worried that that Epaphroditus was going to die and he said it would have like basically broke his heart he would have had sorrow upon sorrow he says which is so interesting how Paul's I mean he's like us because he's he talks about himself dying and he goes man I, I want to die I, wanna, I don't want to die die I just want to be in the presence of the Lord to be absent from this body I'd, I'd much rather be absent from the body and be present with the Lord um, so he saw his own death as gain right to live as Christ to die as gain but because he was still on the earth, if Epaphroditus died, it was like, oh, that would be sorrow upon sorrow for me. So it would be joy for Epaphroditus. It would be joy for Sarah if she went to be with the Lord. Incredible joy. But man, it would be sorrow upon sorrow for this ministry that depends very much on her help. Um, being that we have basically, I guess we have like three employees now. <laughs> um, but um, but we have a very small staff. And um, the, uh, the greater sorrow even for her husband. And um, yeah. So grateful that God is restoring her and thank you for your prayers. And she looks like things are going to continue to improve. And we're praying that that does take place. All right. This is number six. Amber Ribeiro says, my preacher uses the parable of talents to say that we must go out to do work for the Lord. I have chronic illness and I don't have energy for stuff outside my family. What is this? Does this mean I waste my talents? Um, okay. So the parable of the talents is... Um, meant to be generic intentionally. So in the, in the story, Jesus gives, uh, Jesus gives this parable where a man gives talents, which talent here, let me actually, we should just, we should just look at it together. Um, Matthew 25. Let me go to the passage. Okay, I'm just going to read through it really quick. This is just a survey of the, of, the, of the parable, and then we'll apply it to your situation. Should you be going out to do like evangelism and stuff, um, or you're hiding your talent? Um, Matthew 25, 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants. It's interesting how many, I, I try not to make this too long, but how many of Jesus' parables involve someone going on a long journey? Because ultimately Christ was, his second coming was going to be delayed, right? We're not, well, delayed from our perspective, right? It, it's going to be a long time. Um, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one, he gave five talents. To another, 
two to another one to each according to his ability. Okay, this part already people get often very, very confused. Um, understandably, because in English, the word talent means skill or ability. But this word talent is not an English word. It's It comes from a foreign language. It refers to a very large amount of money. Let's just, it's just a very big amount of money. Let's just say it was $500,000, right? And he gives five of these $500,000 bills to one guy. He gives two to another guy and gives one to another. So it's just an amount of money. That's all it is. This is entrusting to them his property, um, ultimately, which is liquefied, is put into money form. And each of them he gives according to their ability. So he gives them a certain amount of resources to use based on how skillful and how good they are capable of engaging in that. Uh, some people as Christians, you, they seem like they have far more opportunity than others to do things for the Lord. Seems like a parallel here. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went once at once. So he goes right away and traded with them and he made five talents more. So also... Uh, he who had made two talents made two talents more. So they both double their amount of money. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money, which is like not even putting it in a bank, right? He's like, like a pirate hiding in the ground. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. Uh, here, I've made five talents more. His master said to them, by the way, just remind you again, after what? After a long time. Again, this is hidden in these parables, these, this idea of, of, of a very long time between the first and second coming of Christ. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Okay, so there's like in this new kingdom that Christ is bringing, we have different responsibilities depending on how we serve the Lord based on what we've been given in this life. And he also who had two talents came forward saying, master. You delivered to me two talents. Here I've made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Notice he gets the same basic treatment, even though he started with less. The point is he was faithful. God only requires your faithfulness. He also, had, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. I was afraid of failure, so I quit. That's, that's the formula I hear here. I was afraid of failure, so I quit. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then ought you to have invested my money with the bankers? Remember, it was money. It was cash that they gave them effectively, right? And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. It wouldn't have been double, but it would have at least had interest. It would have at least been some benefit. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the 10 talents. For to everyone, who, to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this seems to be talking about someone who's simply not saved. Um, so, all that to say, um, the, um, the, 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 the way that you are describing how this verse is used in your life, Amber, your preacher uses the parable of talents to say, we must go out to do work for the Lord. I have a chronic illness. I don't have energy for stuff outside my family. Does this mean I waste my talents? No. Um, the idea of talent is this is what you have according to your ability. That's the nature of these talents, of the, of the money that was invested. How do I relate these to my life? We often think of, we just inevitably think of these as like, what opportunities do I have? What skills do I have? Uh, some people put it into like a cute phrase, time, talents, treasure. You have time on your hands. You have whatever skills you have, actual, real, in English, talents. <laughs> and you have treasure or whatever money you've got that you can invest. I think that if you invest what energy you have, assuming you're not being lazy, if you invest the energy you have in blessing your family, in blessing those you can, in serving the Lord where you're at, that that is you being faithful with the talent symbolically, metaphorically, the talent you've been given. Now, you can, obviously, you can still do stuff. You can minister to people online. You can maybe make ministry happen for your family, for your friends, for your neighbors. And maybe occasionally you can get out and do certain things. But I mean, what do you say to the paraplegic? Like, oh, you're you're hiding your talent because you're not getting out of the home and witnessing door to door. Um, <laughs> uh, no, the, the, the standard of this parable is faithfulness. So the only question you have to ask is, 
with whatever ability you have, with whatever money you have, with whatever time you have, are you being faithful to Jesus in those things? The only other thing I'll add to that, Amber, is we should not think outside the home is work for the Lord and inside the home is not. Your family is your, is your, your first ministry, your, your, your household. It starts there. Like this is ministry for the Lord. And the way that you interact with spouse and friends and kids and loved ones in your home, that is your number one beginning of all your ministry. And the things that happen beyond the home overflow out of that. I shouldn't think of what happens in the home as being something that just takes time away from ministry. I think that's a hurtful thing for us. Um, I hope that some of these things help you, Amber. I, I hope that my answer has given you some wisdom there. Kenna Lynch says, since Adam was sinless before the fall, why didn't he fulfill his role as a husband when Eve was tempted by the serpent? It seems like he was nearby. Man, I was reading about some of this stuff recently because of this whole study on on uh, women in ministry, and it takes you to you know the issue of the fall. And here's what it all hangs on. Let's go to the verse. Um, so um, the serpent comes, and he says, uh, um, he says to the woman, "Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden?" And the woman said to the serpent, "We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said." You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Many people say that Eve added to God's word here, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Um, <clears throat> and because afterwards, what happens is uh, Satan lies to her, and then the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was delightful to the eyes, and that she was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit. And so this, uh, the story I've heard from some leaders is, um, you know, she added to God's word. Eve added to God's word. And the ad addition was, don't even touch it. Okay, well, some, even a, a smaller minority will say, well, Adam is the one who added to it. So Adam was, but this puts sin before the sin, right? Where they're already in sin, it hasn't even happened yet, right? So she's <clears throat> she's thinking, oh, I can't even touch it. And she takes the fruit here in verse uh, six and then goes, oh, I didn't die. I guess I won't die. I think we're reading too much into, in between the verses here. Um <clears throat> I don't think that we're, we're meant to do that. I also think that in, in the Hebrew, when it says, do not, you shall not touch it, I think is, is, is more generic. It's just don't just, Hey, don't even, don't touch anything. It's kind of like you said, don't touch anything. You don't just mean literally don't touch. You just mean have nothing to do with it is what you're really saying. Okay. So let, let's read on. Um, so she, uh, verse six is where it happens. The part you're asking about. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delight, a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was de a des to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And <clears throat> a lot of big statements are made about this phrase, who was with her. Um, statements like, where was Adam while Eve was tempted? Well, it says husband who was with her. So Adam must have been literally standing right there. Satan comes, he talks to Eve and Adam is just standing there and he's abandoning his role as husband. He doesn't correct. He doesn't <clears throat> stop this thing from happening. He just watches and lets it happen. That's, that's what's being said as like the sin of Adam. So Adam, again, here's my problem. The scripture highlights the sin of eating the fruit. It doesn't highlight several sins leading up to the sin of eating the fruit. And so I don't want to add, just like I don't want to say um, Eve added to God's word here. I could just say that's another way of phrasing what God had said. And it's, and see as more generic, it, the term do not touch. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to say that e, uh, Adam sinned by allowing his wife to do these things. I also, when I hear the rebuke of God, I don't hear him rebuking Adam for who was with her. I, I don't hear that. So when I, um, uh, when I go to God who says, Adam, where are you? And then they were like, Hey, I was hiding. Here's what God says to the woman, to the man and to the serpent. He says to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field on your belly, you shall go and dust. You shall eat all the days of your life. He doesn't even explain what the serpent did wrong, right? He just, the serpent knows, he just, he just tells him, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is ultimately going to be talking about the offspring Christ, who is the 
the thread going through all the scripture right here in the book of Genesis. It's already begun the promise of Jesus. To the woman, he says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your, should, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Well, there's nothing here about um, adding to his word, about any of that stuff. It's just they ate, they ate of the tree. Then look at the specific rebuke to Adam. And Adam, to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree. This is the rebuke. You listened to her. And some jerks will be like, see, men shouldn't listen to their wives. Like if, if that's what you think, you have problems that go way beyond any ability to understand scripture. Um, but no, no, it's because he listened to her specifically as she gave him the fruit and she goes, and he goes, okay, I'll, I'll eat it. She was deceived. The new Testament tells us deceived, right? Adam knew what he was doing and what did he do wrong? He listened to the suggestion to eat the fruit. He ate of the tree, right? And it doesn't say that he listened to the serpent. He listened to her. So all that to say, I think we're A, reading a little too much into the section where it says Adam, who was with her. We're implying that that means he was with her the entire time. It doesn't say the serpent came to Adam and Eve. If it did, we would know he was with her the whole time. The serpent said to Eve, it's, it's just to her that he's talking. So not them. And so I'm not going to read that into scripture. Now I'm going to read your question again. Sometimes this helps me to make sure I don't get off base. Uh, since Adam was sinless before the fall, why didn't he fulfill his role as husband when he was tempted by the serpent? It seems like he was nearby. My statement is, um, I don't conclude that he was listening in on the actual conversation. He could have just been, uh, you know, 60 feet away. It could have been that easy. Hey, Adam. Right now, he, he doesn't know that they're talking. He, she says, hey, Adam. And then there he's there. That could be an easy explanation for this. It would fit all the text and the context just as well. There's no affirmation in scripture that he was abandoned. He abandoned some husband role and not doing something. I think we're reading too much into the Bible at that point. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm saying it's not clearly taught. Um, yeah. Now, on the, on the flip side, um, I guess it's possible that there were sins leading up to the sin of eating the fruit. I say possible, but it seems unlikely. It seems that eating, that was the sin. That was the sin. And I don't want to be talking about sins leading up to that as, as like, e even if the, I feel like they give me good object lessons for marriage, I just think it's not careful with scripture. Elizabeth Knowles has a question. In bodybuilding, the usage of performance enhancing drugs are not illegal and are used by higher level competitors. As a Christian, would it be considered sinful to utilize as a tool to be competitive in this pro league? Um, oh yeah, there's no more questions, y'all. Just letting you know, <laughs> no more questions. We're full up on questions for today. Um, um, I, I can't answer this question. I'm ju I just have to fully admit I'm beyond my own understanding. Okay, I, don't, I know nothing about performance enhancing drugs. All I can suggest is there are some principles that I would try to apply to this area that seems great to me um, is, you know, let me take you to scripture actually that, that talks about these, these types of things. Um, okay. Paul is dealing with liberty issues in the church and in Corinth, they feel like they have liberty and um, we do have a lot of liberty, but, but there are those who tend to lean towards liberty in a way that's um, dismissing carnality. And so Paul wants to affirm our liberty in Christ in perhaps enjoy, in, in using performance enhancing drugs, perhaps I say, but at least here are some principles I would try to apply to that scenario. So all things are lawful for me. Notice this is in quotes. This is a statement he hears from them. Now he's not saying it's false. You know, they're not under the law. So you shouldn't be like, oh, you can't eat that. You can't taste that. You can't touch that. As far as like, say, say pork, for instance. Right. Okay. All things are lawful for me, but he's going to qualify it. And here's the wisdom, but not all things are helpful. Okay. Is this performance enhancing drug actually helpful? Okay. I imagine some of them can be helpful and some can be harmful. And that'll be a decision you have to think through. What sort of help or harm is this causing? Well, it's going to help me compete. Okay. But what, what else? Like long-term liver damage. I mean, what, what else is going to go on? Does it cause mood swings? Does it, does it affect your ability to be in the spirit? Those are other questions. All things are lawful for me right? Again, he quotes them and he's not going to say they're wrong about it, but he's going to add the nuance, but I will not be dominated by anything. That is, I will not come under the control of something. 
And here's an issue where you have to ask like things you enjoy habitually, especially things that are like chemicals <laughs> that you enjoy, that maybe they're not inherently sinful, but is it taking over? Is it is it an addiction now? And that that's a serious thing we have to ask ourselves, right? I, are you being dominated by this thing? And so, yeah, is my life becoming controlled by this thing? My, um, you know, when you're assessing if something is a is an addiction, you might ask a question like, "Am I making sacrifices that I shouldn't make to have this thing?" Like that's that's the idea of the domination that it's happening in my life. Um, then he goes on, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Hey, come on, God, God, this is, this is what all the pot smokers like to say, right? God, hey man, God gave us the green stuff to, to, you know, eat the green herbs of the field, right? That's what it says in scripture. Of course, herb doesn't mean what you think it means there. But, um, but yeah, so food's meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Like, yeah, God, God's given me all these things. But I like what Paul says. He goes, yeah, and God will destroy both one and the other. That there is this final judgment day where, where God is going to, wipe everything out and remake it because the purpose of creation is ultimately for him. And so now he goes on to talk about specifically sexual morality. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, right? Is it, is it meant for sex within marriage? Absolutely. But not, not sexual immorality, but for the Lord, you are made for God and the Lord for the body. You're using yourself. In, in this case, he rebukes them for, for, um, sexual sins and he's like, hey, man, this is, it's all natural. It's all natural. It's like, hey, God kind of gave me these appetites. I'm engaging in them. He goes, look, God's going to destroy all things at some point. You need to focus on being for him. You belong to God. God, God. God owns you. You serve him. And this is what he wants to drive into their hearts is you are a Christian who lives for the Lord. And if you, as a Christian who's living for Jesus, can partake of this thing and give God thanks and say it's not it's not 1 Corinthians 6, 12 here, it's not harming me right because not everything's helpful it's not dominating me and it is for the and i could do this for the lord well then go for it go for it ultimately do all things for the glory of god i would try to use those tests to evaluate whether or not to be engaged in that thing and it's good to go into it willing to say i'll sacrifice whatever you want me to lord i'll abandon this this pursuit i'll set aside this thing if it's not honoring to you and then, then you're in the right place in your heart. You're willing to give it up, even if whether you have to or not, depends. Uh, Braderick has a question, or Braderick. Um, according to scripture, all humans are flawed. There are no examples of humans being perfect apart from Christ. Therefore, how can anyone deem the Bible 100% perfect when its authors were imperfect? Uh, to me, this is I, this may, seems like a real challenging question to some. To me, it seems like a real easy question. Um, that is, I'm not perfect, but does that mean that every single thing I do is wrong? And the answer is no. Like I can still do two plus two equals four, right? Like I can give you the right answer, even though I am flawed and I don't always give right answers. I can give a right answer. And God, through the work of his Holy Spirit in our lives, can have a person write the scripture as he wants them to write it. I don't think he dictated it to them, but he allowed something right and perfect to come out of a flawed person. And um, so I just don't see how this is a challenge to scripture at all. Um, like, and, and you can think of this in your own life. You're flawed, you make mistakes, you do things wrong, but maybe there's been a time where you gave someone the perfect advice. They were going through something and you just gave them the perfect, perfect advice. And maybe it was the Lord leading you. Maybe it was just you, you just knew the perfect advice and you helped them and they went and they did the thing and it really helped their life. Now imagine God selecting just the right people at the right moments, giving them a, 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 the ability through his Holy Spirit to write just the right thing at the right time. So we have Isaiah who wrote about how he saw the Lord and he wrote what God wanted him to write, but he still says of himself, I'm a man of unclean lips. Like he, he was, he's a fault filled man, but God used him anyway. So I see no reason uh, to think that the inspiration of scripture depends upon the writers of scripture being perfect, 100% perfect. Um, no, no, they just had to be used at that moment to write the thing God wanted them to write. That's all they had to be. Number 10, Stephanie Morris has a question. Hi, Pastor Mike. I've been so blessed by your ministry. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, in this last year, today I want to know how we can all pray for you and your ministry. Thank you for all you do. May the Lord bless and keep you. Well, one of the, the things I'll, I'll be very transparent with you guys, um, one of the things I could use prayer for is sleep. I just do not sleep well. I have I have not slept consistently well in years. 
And that gives me bad days where I'm just like exhausted and um, it's hard to study and hard to focus. Certain things you can do when you're tired and other things are difficult. Well, spending the day reading scholarly papers on the Greek word kephale to see if it means source, authority, both, or preeminence or something else, which is what I've been doing the past few days, um, is like, you know, hard to do when you're tired. So I, I just appreciate prayer that my sleep would be good. But um, but yeah, like that that's on a personal level. That That's that's the prayer, that my, my sleep would be good. And for wisdom, wisdom above all else, I just need wisdom. You know, it's the one thing I need most right now is wisdom to know what to say yes to, what to say no to. I turn I, I turn things down all the time trying to think of when to, what to use my time on. I'm amazed and blown away that my ministry is reaching so many people and that it's impacting the lives of so many people. I'm like truly shocked. Um, and I see it as a heavy responsibility to do it properly and do it well and conduct my time well and think, yeah, I, I just see it all. I take it all very heavily and I pray for wisdom that I would be able to do that well. So yeah, there's a prayer request. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate it. Um, uh, TJ Higley says, who are the watchers in Daniel four seventeen? Do they play an in times role? Thanks, Pastor Mike. Um, Daniel four seventeen. All right. I'm not gonna be able to answer this question sufficiently, but I'll, I'll walk through it with you guys a little bit. Um, this is, this is a, uh, I'm going to, I'm trying to think of how much of this passage I'm going to read. Let's, I'll read a larger section of it for your sake. Um, okay. So getting, getting clarity on a vision here, here, the, the vision request is the vision of my head as I lay in bed were these, I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong and its top reached to the heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in, the be in bed and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast flee from under it and the birds from under its, from its branches. Okay. So it's going to, this tree is going to be destroyed. It came at the decree um, of this watcher. Let the beast flee from under it and the birds from its branches, verse 15, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth and bound uh, bound with a band of iron and bronze and made the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Notice how it turns to personal. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let be a beast mind be given to him and let seven periods of time, seven years, pass over him. The sentence is by, and here's the watcher again, the sentence is by the decree of the watchers. Okay, now it's now it's plural. There's a single decree of a group called the Watchers, the decision by the word of the Holy Ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules to the king, rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. So um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is the guy that has the dream and um, he wants Daniel to interpret it for him. And, he, and so Daniel gives him the interpretation. Hey, you're going to be, you're going to be made basically crazy. You're going to lose your power and your throne for seven years. And, um, you know, because God wants to humble you and, and it works. God does humble him. The thing is like, who are these watchers who are making a decree? Well, the, the, the name watcher implies something about them. Let's be humble about this. Okay. There's some who you already know all the answers to this question. That's fine. I don't. Okay. So I'm going to move it, move through it slowly and be tentative with my answers. Um, they're, they're called watchers, which implies what they're watching. Like their job is to observe the things that are going on on earth and to either make decisions or take actions based upon some of those things. Okay, so they're watchers. They're also called holy ones. The holy ones. Twice, they're, while they're called watchers, they're also called holy ones. Which often is a thing referring to angels. To be called a holy one. Okay, so they, they may be refer, referring to angels. So here we go. Okay, easy peasy, right? You can say, well, their watchers are simply angels that have some measure of authority to, to watch over and then decree things, maybe maybe God gives them a decree and they decree it over mankind. Um, that may be the case. Uh, we, we should probably think that angels have varied responsibilities. Angels are different kinds of things. There's different kinds of angels. They're not the same. They're not all naked baby angels shooting arrows at people. Um, probably not any are doing that. <laughs> um, but no, there, there are a variety. 
but there, there also are a variety of heavenly beings that we see in scripture, right? And, and, and they're in visions and their experiences, but some of them seem like there really aren't just visions. There are just different kinds of heavenly beings. They just look different. Sometimes they come in human guise, right? But even then, sometimes there's an evi- there's something evident about them that they're, they're more than just human. So there's a variety of things going on with different angels. So when I say it's an angel, I'm not really saying that much, am I? Because I don't know that much about angels, really. And maybe you do. I personally don't. I mean, I'm saying I haven't maybe done all the homework on this topic. Um, one day, maybe I'll study angels. It's very low on my list, to be honest. I've got plenty of other things I want to I spend massive time on first. Um, and so, so, yeah. Now, what you can do is you can go to intertestamental literature. You can go to, like, Jewish non-biblical literature written by Jews in between the close of say Malachi, the end of the old Testament and the coming of Christ. And you can read in all kinds of stuff. They talk about watchers. Now, if you think that stuff's accurate, you're going to adopt a lot more theological commitments about who these beings are. I'm not going to do that. So all I'm suggesting is they seem to be a type of heavenly, um, creature, an angel, right? That is given some kind of role of observing and maybe even deciding, because it's a decree of the watchers. I say maybe deciding, because it might be a decree handed from God to them that they then they then um, engage in. So I, I'm just going to be humble and say there's my thoughts on it. Saft is, has a question. My baby's kindergarten has hired a trans person who advocates. If, kids, if, if a kid asks, they will say that he is trans. My baby is just one. Is it even safe for her to be with this confused person? Any advice? Um, there's, okay. Um, like, I don't want to, I don't want to react in a way where we're like boogeyman. Okay. Cause like when I see a person who's trans, I don't see, um, a, a person who's an abuser of children, a person who's all those other things. I see somebody who's got what I'm going to call, um, uh, gender confusion. Okay. And, and my heart goes out to them because, that's a difficult thing. That's a struggle. That's a battle. And the world isn't helping. The world is pushing them further into confusion. The world is affirming confusion and, 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 and throwing them off into confusion in a way that I think is not helpful to them. So primarily, my heart is like, hey, I care about you. Now, more than I want you to you know, come to a realization of your actual, that, that it's good that God made you the way he did, that your physical body does represent your actual physical makeup, you know, that man is man and woman is woman. That's a healthy and good thing. The more, more than I want you to know that though, and to, and to be at peace with your body, right? As opposed to like the ultimate, when you think about it, trans is like the ultimate body shaming. I'm going to, I'm going to be ashamed of and hateful of my actual design and pretend it's that I'm different than that. And I want the, I want everyone around me to pretend that too, or I'll, or I'll consider myself a massive victim of their mistreatment. And this is not a healthy, this is not healthy psychology to do this to people. Um, but at any rate, I'd much rather them be a Christian and struggle with that. Like I much primarily, I want them to know the gospel of Christ, the love of Jesus Christ, the transformation that comes through faith in him. That's the primary concern. Um, so when you see, um, a trans person, that's what you think. Okay. That's what I think. But you say who advocates now, here's the thing. If your kids in a school and you're anybody in your school, whether they're trans or not, If they're advocating for views that are wrong and they're advocating them around your kids, you probably don't really want them either. You don't want your kids in the school or you need to take specific steps to try to help advocate for truth in the mind of your own kid. At one year old, there's probably not a lot of advocating going on, but it's going to happen. And so I think um, I I pray for God to give you wisdom. I, I can't tell you the exact thing to do with your 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 situation right there. Those are some of my thoughts on it. Um, if your kid's in an ungodly environment, then your the parents have to do even more to get a godly biblical worldview into the mind and heart of the child. And that's important. So the advocating is different than the being of trans. Do you understand that? This is important to me. Um, the trans agenda is harmful to people psychologically, but Trans people aren't all part of the trans agenda. There's a, there, these are two different things. A trans person, my heart goes out to someone who's suffering a lot of confusion and, and harm. And the agenda, I think, is causing, I think the agenda is hurting trans people more than anybody else. Okay, this is, this is it's, as much as I could get in trouble for saying these things. Isn't that weird? I could actually get in trouble just for vocalizing these opinions 
um, nowadays, especially depending on which, so, which social media you're on and what um, country you live in. We're reinforcing psychological harm when we push the trans agenda. We're reinforcing and pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And oh, that's, that's sad. So I, I don't want to do that to people. I also know that young people especially are prone towards this kind of confusion, not understanding their identity um, and finding a sense of security by being able to label themselves something, so especially something that's a little bit different, a little unique. It makes them feel like they have security in it. So like that's why you have like people that are punk when they're like 16, but they're like 25 and they're totally not, right? Because there's something about finding these sort of obscure identities that we use to identify with ourselves when we're young um, that help us find security and feel like we know who we are. And that's who's being targeted by this agenda. And I think they're being hurt by it as well. So yeah, God help us. Um, that was number 12. Number 13, Walter Portillo says, my girlfriend, a devout Catholic, and I, a devout Protestant, broke up recently after dating for a year we wanted to get married but we broke up due to our faiths where can i read for comfort well there are a few things that are more difficult than a breakup uh, especially a breakup like that you're like talking about getting married um time is going to be the, one of the best things for you walter is time and um i think that if i were to encourage you to read for comfort would be read um, um, the passages that talk about the kind of man that God has called you to be. Read 1 Corinthians 7 that talks about, at least for this season when you're in singleness, about how singleness can be used for the Lord. I think that would be something you could read. I think you can read that, I mean, look at, look at some of the, <laughs> this might sound strange, look at some of the disasters that occurred through unwise couplings that happened in scripture and you can say wow um i've i've perhaps you know this breakup has given me a chance to reset my mentality about dating and relationships and to be thinking carefully about who i want to pursue in the future read proverbs to talk about the kind of man you want to be and to see the kind of woman you want to seek um, these are some of the recommendations i would have i know you're just looking for comfort but I'm, I guess I'm thinking about preparing you for the next stage of your life. And so I don't know if that helps, but I hope it does. Let's go to Josh Bernard, Joshua Bernard. Will God judge us for what we said or for what we meant by those words? Um, I, I, that's a great question. I think it's going to be both. I think it's what you said and what you meant. Um, and here's part of the reason. When I say things, depending, you know, maybe I don't mean it that way, but that's how someone took it, right? And um, and the other issue is so, so my, my words have an impact in other people and the impact I have in others, I think matters. So it's not like I'm just a microcosm. I was thinking about this recently. Forgive me guys, this is a really weird analogy, but, um, when you're playing a video game, <laughs> there are what are called NPCs, non-player characters. And you're, you're, if you're playing a game on your alone, it's not multiplayer, you're alone. You're the only like person in the game. Everyone else, even though they have, if they have dialogue or if they have little, you know, characters that run around and do things and say things, they're not real people. And you know this, right? Like, so that's why the whole world, all that matters is your experience in this world. And all I'm going to suggest is that there are a lot of people who go around the world and they sort of do this, right? They don't think everyone's an NPC, but they sort of act like I have like my five people I really care about and everybody else is an NPC. I don't really care that much about them. It's as though they're not real. So I think that the words I say, they impact others. Like right now, everything I'm saying is impacting you. And maybe I didn't mean it that way, but there's at least some measure of accountability for how it impacted you. Now, maybe you took it wrong. Maybe you misunderstood. Maybe you got confused, but I feel like there's some place where I have an accountability for how my words impact you, even if I didn't mean it that way. But there's a greater accountability for how I meant it, for how I meant it. And so I think it's both. But ultimately, these aren't my decisions to make. I don't judge people's intentions. I don't hold people accountable for things they meant. Um, not ultimately, God does. So God will judge perfectly with perfect righteous judgment, exactly everything appropriately. And for those who have Jesus, he will judge you through Christ. Meaning that Jesus takes the punishment for the sins you've committed and you receive the grace and forgiveness. So when you become more aware of your sin and the things you've done in the past, it should only make you that much more grateful to Jesus for the sacrifice he made for you. Tobias Sedneff says, <clears throat> how should we understand the dynamic, the power dynamic 
within the Trinity, specifically as it applies to sending the, the filioque clause in mind. Does the, does the father have a sort of sending authority over the son and spirit? Um, so there's, I'm going to try to avoid like certain terms. I, I normally, when I talk about theology, I try to use as few big the theology terms as I can. Like I'll maybe one or two here and there. I try to use as few as I can because I think that they're unnecessarily challenging for people who are learning. So uh, I'll just say this. <clears throat> we all agree that the father sent the son. Um, the, the debate comes into how does that relate to the relationship between the father, son, and spirit eternally, not just since creation. You know, the father sends the son, the son takes on, you know, incarnate form. Um, the, the, then the, the father and son send the Holy Spirit after Jesus ascends. And we see that happening, but we're talking like, is there an eternal relationship of submission from the son to the father and of like sort of a yielding that's going on there? And um, I think that 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 has that has been a debate that I personally don't know the right answer to. Oddly enough, I've been digging into it a bit in this women in ministry study, believe it or not. I know this sounds weird, but it really is that big of a branching study that this uh, th this is a kind of a big deal. Um, but there is a difference between saying that the son is yielding, to my understanding, yielding to the father at, in, in, you know, in the what they call the economic trinity, forgive the term here, but the relationship within the trinity, not the nature of the trinity. So, right, when you talk about like the way the Father, Son, and Spirit relate, it's one thing to say that the Son yields, submits as a way of expressing love in the trinity, and something else to suggest that the Son is inferior to the Father in some sort of um, like ontological, forgive me for the term, on the nature of the son, that he's actually inferior in nature. That would be a big problem theologically for us. So um, I'm open to both of those options, as long as we're not saying the son is created or the son is um, uh, inferior in nature eternally. Like that would be the two things that I would push back against. And I think the church historically would push back against those as well. But I would be open and I would not draw a line on the filioque clause <laughs> personally. Um, although, although that did cause quite a split at the time. Um, yeah. So maybe in the future, I'll have better, stronger, and more accurate opinions about that. Um, speak truth says, can you explain the biblical view on the, the little God's theory? Psalm 82, six and John 10, 34. Thank you. And God bless you in your ministry. Um, Okay, there's this verse in the Old Testament you guys are probably somewhat familiar with. And it's in Psalm 82, where I'm just gonna read the whole Psalm. God is, this is in the ESV and your translation does matter here, right? Let me, I'll read just the first verse in two different translations so you can see. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Okay, here's NASB. God takes his stand in his own congregation. A congregation is not the divine council, right? He judges in the midst of the rulers. Well, they're not called gods here. They're called rulers. Is it NASB or is it ESV? Well, let, let's look at NIV, okay? God presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. But the, the uh, NIV adds quotes around gods so that you know that gods is not literal. Okay, so the, these are the translators trying to wrestle with a challenging word, thinking, how do we translate this great assembly or divine council or what? Do we put gods in quotes? Do we call it, do we show that it's it's not literal by just calling it midst of the rulers? Or do we do what ESV does and just call it the midst of the gods? What is it, right? Um, so I've given you just three translations there. Um, this is a complicated, <laughs> challenging passage of scripture for sure. What makes it even, um, well, I'm gonna read the whole Psalm, then I'll read what Jesus said about it. And then we'll discuss briefly a couple options and we'll show why the cults are all using this verse wrong. Um, so God's, let's take the ESV for a second. God's taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly or show partiality to the wicked? So God's rebuking this group of people. They're obviously leaders, okay? They're obviously leaders of of groups of people, of nations, in a sense. Um, give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. This is the call. By the way, every government should be doing this, right? Um, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. 
They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. The security that comes from proper government is not there, and, it, and it's, it's, it's terrible. Verse 6, here's the judgment upon them now. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. Um, let me just talk briefly, overview of options on Psalm 82. Option one, um, you take it quite literal, that there are these beings called gods that are literal and real beings, but they're gods in a very special qualified sense. The English word gods is obviously not super good for translating it because it's frequently seen as midst of the rulers or gods in quotes to show you it's not literal or uh, New King James says, um, actually does say in the gods, New King James. I didn't expect that. I guess I forgot. Um, at any rate, the, the word there is Elohim in, in, the, in the Hebrew. And the word Elohim can be used of multiple different beings, not just God Almighty. Uh, when, when, when Samuel is dead and his spirit returns to speak to Saul, he is called an Elohim. Okay, but, but they don't even mean to imply that he's a deity here, right? The word can be used to talk about a disembodied, powerful spiritual being. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean God in the English sense. So be it. Um, so one option is, though, that there are these angelic type beings, and they are the divine council. This is like Michael Heiser's, his whole thing, right? It's like this, based on this idea. And this divine council is a group of beings, not, they're not like Zeus and Thor and stuff like that, but they're a group of, of sp powerful spiritual beings. Somebody might call them angels, although I don't think that Michael Heiser would prefer that. And they are having, they have some governing authority over mankind, but that they have used this authority wrongly and they're not properly, this, this is what Paul calls the principalities and powers. And they're not using the authority properly and therefore God is going to kill them. He's, he's like, you're going to die like, like men you'll fall like any prince. So one interpretation is, yes, there's the, these beings. Now these would be, and I'm going to use this fancy term again, forgive me, ontologically different than Yahweh, than the God of the Old Testament, right? They're not eternal. They're not, they're created beings. They're limited in power. They're, they're nothing like rivals to God. They are spiritual beings that have power and have influence in the lives of mankind. Um, I don't lean that way. Okay. That's one interpretation of this of this chapter. I, I lean the, the, the easy way out, some might call it, right? <laughs> that these just are human kings. They're just human kings. They're called gods because it's sarcasm, right? But it's also a, and, and, and I'm going to defend this in a minute because there's a reason why I might be wrong here. Um, it's sarcasm. They're called gods because all governing authority comes from God. Like when God said to Moses, Moses, you will be like God to Pharaoh. And Aaron, your brother, will be like you are to me, right? So Moses isn't actually a god, but Moses is being sent as God's messenger to give out God's commands to Pharaoh. So there's a sense in which all authority comes from God and governing authorities, the massive power of government to control the lives of large numbers of people and the leaders, usually monarchical leaders back in the day, right? One guy ruling the whole thing. These people are like, they're like gods. But Psalm 82 is like, hey, guess what? God judges you guys. You're like God's on earth, but God judges you guys and he's rebuking you the whole time. And then he tells you, oh yeah, you're God's in the sense that you have power over mankind, but you are going to die and you're going to fall like any prince. Okay. So that, I lean that way. That's, I lean towards that interpretation. Either way, there's still only one real God out there. <laughs> That's important to understand. The cults always misuse that passage. But things get even more challenging when you get to the New Testament. And I have some videos on this where I talk about it in greater detail. Um, I think in the New Age, the, the video I did on New Age beliefs with Melissa Doherty, we have um, a, uh, a, um, a section where I deal with this in greater detail and it's all prepared and I have notes. So it's not just off the top of my head. But here in John 10, 34, um, let me read the passage to you. So the Jews pick up stones to stone him. Right, because he says that him and the Father are one, which implies the deity of Christ. Um, then Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it's not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself like God. Or make yourself God, excuse me. I added like there unintentionally. Um, you make yourself God, but you're just a man. So you can't be a man and be God is kind of the complaint. Jesus answers them, is it not written in your law? 
I said, you are gods. If you call them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the father consecrated and sent in the world, you are blaspheming because you said, I am the son of God? Then he goes on and he gives them more reasons to affirm who he says he is. But how is he quoting Psalm 82? Is Jesus saying that they're, you know, I'm just going to give you my interpretation because considering how long this is getting. <laughs> um, their complaint, you're a man and you're making yourself God, that's wrong. And, and Jesus is going to say, hey, this kind of concept has been prefigured in the scriptures. Is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. Right? So there's some kind of sense in which mankind is called Elohim in some sense in the Old Testament. Then he, then he goes on, he says, it's in a greater sense true of him. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and I interpret this not to be angels or divine beings or something like that, which would be the Heiser interpretation. I interpret this to be um, the, the Israelites and the kings themselves. The psalm was written and it was written for the humans. And the humans are called gods in a sense. Again, I think like the ES or the uh, NASB, I think it was, no, NIV puts it in quotes, the word gods. I think that's an appropriate thing there. He calls them gods, but Jesus is greater than that, right? He's not the one to whom the word of God came. He's the one whom the father consecrated and sent into the world. Okay, let me offer then my big picture thought on this, at least at the moment. <laughs> Forgive me for not always knowing what I'll think five years from now. But my, my thought on this is, is this. Human rulers, they're just humans, but they're called gods Sar somewhat sarcastically, but also in a picture of the fact that they have divine authority. That's how they, they can rule. It's God's authority that, that government borrows when they rule. That is merely a picture. That's the one to whom the word of God came. But when the word of God himself shows up, he fulfills that entirely. He becomes the fullness of that, right? You guys are called God's in a sense, right? He is God with us. And so there's a elevation when it comes to Christ, and this is consistent, when we see pictures of Christ in the Old Testament and the fulfillment of the New, there's this elevation. It, it, it intensifies over and over again. So that would be my understanding. Now, the impact it would have on the Jews is interesting. When Jesus quotes this passage, they're just dumbfounded. They just It's it's like he gave them a really hard puzzle they don't have time to solve, and then he just kind of walks away. And I think that's the impact it had. They were trying to stone him, and he got them caught up in a debate and... That's how it ends. I, I, I hope that I probably, I pr hope I provided more clarity than confusion for you guys there. Um, Summer Monsoon says, hi, Mike, did Jacob really wrestle with God? Why does Genesis make it sound as though he won this fight? Thank you. Um, in the passage where Jacob wrestles with God, um, he will not let, he goes, I will not let you go until you bless me. And you said, Genesis makes it feel like he won this fight. But the actual reality is it was kind of like, it was kind of like both. He sort of won and lost. So he, it, he's, he's named Israel because he's what he wrestled with God and man and has prevailed. So he came out in victory, but he couldn't overcome. According to the passage, when he's wrestling, he can't overcome the one he's wrestling. Now, God obviously could just snap him out of existence, but, but he just can't overpower him. And I think that part of that is the lesson. You can't overpower me. And then the man, you know, God ultimately touches Jacob's hip and he has a permanent injury there causing him to limp. You see, it's, in, and I think the lesson, it may sound cliche, but I think it's, it's not cliche when you understand it in your life. In only in dependence upon God will he really find his prevailing. All his wrestling with mankind led him to a standstill with his brother, and there he stands with a, in a standstill with God, right? That, that's the setting of the Peniel experience when he sees God, and he's at a standstill with his brother. His brother's gonna kill him. He's, he's fearing he's gonna die that night. All of his machinations and all of his workings, they, you know, they, it kind of went like this. It was like he'd, he'd go forward two steps, back a step, go forward a step, back two. That was kind of his life. Finally, he encounters God. He wrestles with God. And in the end, he just has total dependence on God. Look, I don't have the power, but I refuse to let go of you, God. I need you to bless me. This is an attitude of someone who's just totally dependent upon God. And they see even their own weakness as something that makes them dependent on God. Um, and that's how he prevailed. And I, th I think that's the lesson for us. And Paul talks about this, right? When he says, in my, I rejoice in infirmities. In, in my weakness, I am strong, right? I rejoice in my, in think about the power of these words. This is a man who experienced serious physical crippling type illness. 
And God didn't take it away. This is a thorn in his flesh. And he says, I rejoice in my infirmity. Right? Because then the power of Christ is manifest in me. But this is the great lesson. You being strong isn't you being strong. You depending on God is you being strong. Number 18, A.D. Chan says, 1 Corinthians 13, 1, refers to speaking in the tongues of men and of angels. The tongues of men is just different languages, but what are the tongues of angels? And praise the Lord for Sarah Zimmerman. Amen to that. Thank you, God, for um, saving us by, by slowly healing her. And we pray that would continue. It's in a long, it's going to be a long road still, but she's doing much better than she was. The way of love. Okay, 13, 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Oh, all right, I'll put it on your screen too. Um, okay, the tongues of men, uh, and tongues in scripture means languages. Okay, it, it, we used to do this in English. We used to say tongues to mean languages. It's still there in more like higher education, we see this, but not as much in normal discussion. Um, but yeah, tongues just means languages. So it languages of angels. So it's clearly speaking that there are languages of angels, or at least at minimum, there are tongues of men and at least one language of angels. Um, I don't know how, I guess you might have to look at the Greek or something to figure out if the tongues plural refies to, replies to, uh, refers to the men, tongues of men and tongues of angels, or if tongues refers to tongues of men and angels, whereas man and angelic language, there's plural, but not necessarily plural lang ang uh, angelic languages. I don't know. Um, there's also those, I've read a commentary who said that they thought this was um, hyperbole from Paul's part. He didn't think they actually were speaking in any tongues of angels. So that's possible. It's possible that it's hyperbole. But I don't see anything in the passage that indicates it's hyperbole. Here, tongues, he's saying, he's speaking of a miraculously given language. So there's no reason to think that they would consider it hyperbole when he speaks of angelic language. It's also practically, it makes sense. I mean, angels communicate, right? Like they communicate, and I don't think they learned this from humans. They were there when, when, when mankind was made. Job talks about how um, they, were, uh, they were there witnessing the creation of the, of the stars. And so if, if that's the case and angels were already there, they were already communicating, there's definitely language going on and discussion going on in heaven. So it seems to me that angels would have languages. Now, it might just be that Paul took for granted that angels had some kind of language they used, and he wasn't saying that he spoke with angels' tongues. That's the next question is, does Paul think this is a reality? Does he think people are on the regular that Christians are speaking with angelic tongues. And that's where I'll push back. And I'll say everything in the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 13 is meant to be a, a super exaggerated thing. He, it's not normal. It's all, um, it is hyperbolic in the sense that it's, people don't normally do this. So let's look at the, the things. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels. Okay, not everybody does speak in tongues at all. Um, but his point is, even if you did this amazing thing, taking even angels language, um, you're just a noisy, you don't have love, you're just a noisy gong. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, these are all extreme extreme statements that most people are not experiencing, right? Do people have, do you know anybody who has prophetic powers, understands all mysteries, all knowledge, and all faith so as to remove mountains? I don't know anybody who's ever in history been that, except Jesus. And <laughs> so... Um, so should I conclude that people do speak in angelic tongues? No, uh, it, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying this verse isn't teaching it. It seems to teach angelic language exists. Doesn't seem to teach that you are accessing it or you will access it if you speak in tongues because it's an extreme. The final one is if I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Um, most people don't give away all they have nor do they deliver their body to be burned nor are they supposed to necessarily. So yeah, all extreme situations. Nikki Steph says, my aunt tells me to go to church because that's when the Holy Spirit descends and is with us. Is this true? I'm abroad for school and I don't understand the language that well. Should I still go? Um, you should go to church because that's what God wants you to do. <laughs> that would be my answer, Nikki. Um, go to church because the Lord wants you to go to church. You're in fellowship there. It's uh, uh, read, read Ephesians. Like really just read 
why not today? Just read straight through the book of Ephesians and see the value of the church and its place in your life and how you're supposed to be there to, to bless and minister to others. Um, but the church here refers to the people, not just the building. So you can gather with the church in any building. The important thing is you're gathering with the body of Christ for spiritual things. Does the Holy Spirit descend though? I don't know what that means. Um, biblically speaking, we do have some moments when the Spirit descended, right? Acts 2, the Spirit descended upon the apostles. That was this like amazing moment in Acts chapter 2 when they spoke in tongues. We have the Spirit descending upon Jesus in the baptism. But we don't have this like regular experience where whenever the church gathers, the Holy Spirit descends. I think the more regular experience, according to Ephesians, is that the body of Christ has given different gifts and skills and God nurtures us through each other. Just like my, my finger receives nourishment through my hand, through my arm, my heart. It's when we come together that we receive the nourishment, the spiritual nourishment that we get from one another. Um, I'm hopefully bringing a nourishment to you as I teach and talk about the word of God and scripture and encourage you and point you to Christ. This is me trying to exercise my gift for the body. I mean, we're not gathered as a church, but there's a piece of church happening here online. It doesn't replace a physical gathering. It really doesn't, but it's a blessing and it's part of what being the church is. Um, so yeah, I think you should gather. I think the terminology of the Holy Spirit descends is more of like um, Pentecostal terminology that it doesn't exactly fit scripture. Every time the Spirit descends in scripture, it's like a real big moment. Like the Spirit descends. Okay, when when the Holy Spirit comes in the temple, they can't even, they can't, and the place is filled with smoke and they can't even uh, do ministry. So what I don't want to say is when I gather with the body, I'm very aware of God and I'm worshiping God and I'm having a wonderful time. I don't want to call that the Holy Spirit descending because I feel like I'm devaluing what the Holy Spirit was doing in scripture when he descended. So I'm going to avoid that terminology personally. Um, doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's not working. It's just the terminology. I, but I, but I'm all, at the same time, if, if it was my aunt, I wouldn't correct her. I wouldn't because why <laughs> let's just fellowship and not worry about it <laughs> and if, if a great opportunity or the door opens to talk about an issue that's fine i don't I, i'm answering these questions because this is such a great avenue i, I I'm, a, I'm far away from you i'm a guy on a screen talking and you can hear me and think about it and you go mm, i like it i don't i'm not your your nephew or niece having a private conversation where i'm telling you what you're using that term wrong i, I think most of what we see, we need to just overlook if we're going to get fellowship with people. <laughs> That's just how life is. Um, Enoch, last question says, what's the best way to get closest to Christ? Closest to Christ. Um, well, uh, you may overestimate my own spirituality to ask me such a question, Enoch. Um, but it's a great question. How do, you know? So let me talk, let me answer the different question. How do you get closer to Jesus, right? Um well, scripture says in James, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. But there's a specific context to that. Let me take you to the passage. Um, James chapter four, verse eight. Here, here's an example of this. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Okay, so there's a sense of like, I can take an act, action of drawing near to God. Now you might think, okay, well, that would be worship. I, I draw near to God as I, I'll pull my guitar off the wall and I'll sit and I'll worship. And I do sense that I'm drawing near to God when I'm doing that. I mean, I'm blessed. My spirit is, is refocused upon the Lord and I'm encouraged and, um, sin looks more worthless to me when I worship. Isn't that interesting dynamic? Have you guys noticed that sin seems more worthless when you spend time worshiping, um, reading the word. And it's interesting how that works, but let's look at the context in James because there's something specific happening here. Um, let me back up a little bit to James chapter four, verse one. He goes, what causes quarrels and causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, you, uh, so you can, or excuse me, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask amiss, or I'm, I'm, I'm reading like New King James in my head, and ESV on your screen here. So you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You're adulter you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Wait, there's a distancing thing between me and God. Is is And not just friendship with worldly people. It's not just knowing people in the world, but rather friendship with the world in the sense of 
Um, I am united to the sinful desires of the world, the ungodly pursuits of the world, the, the, the principles, the priorities of ungodliness, of worldliness. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is to no purpose? The scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. There's a sense in which God's like, I long for you to be fully mine. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. This is about repentance. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's about turning from sin. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. <clears throat> the short answer is this. If you have sin issues, you recognize that there's been a priority of loving the world instead of loving God. You turn from that, you mourn, you grieve over that, and you call out to God for his grace. And when you do that, God draws near to you. So if you're distanced from God because of sin, mourning, grief, repentance is all about the thing, is, is, is the path, I should say, to restoration in closeness with Christ. You get close to God because you're far from Christ because you've gone into the world. And when you separate yourself and your heart from those things, you draw near to God and then he draws near to you. He's ready, right, and, and willing. Um, so when it's sin, that's one of the biggest things that draws us from God. Your sin has separated you from God. God would say to the Israelites, um, your sin separates you from God. And he's like, but, but draw near to me, repent and mourn and grieve over those sins and turn and, and trust in faith to me. And he will give grace to the humble. He will give grace to the humble. So the, the, the issue that originally separates us from God is our sin. And the issue after we're saved that hurts our closeness with Christ is also our sin. This is typically the thing that's causing the problem more often than not. I would look inwardly and, and, and deal with those issues first, primarily and watch how many, you know, God said, Jesus said, and forgive seven times 70, right? Forgive constantly. Well, God forgives you constantly. You, you, you turn to him, you trust in him, have a time of mourning and repentance over sin issues. And that's the, that's the thing that will draw you closest to Christ. I think, um, other things you can do, times of worship, reading the word, prayer. I, I think sin is where you want to start, and then the other things will start to flood in. Um, but I'm speaking from my own experience as well. What what pulls me from Christ the most is sin. What draws me closest to Christ is repentance. So, um, yeah, I hope that this has been a blessing to you guys. Um, I will be with you again next Friday. Quick announcement. Still working on my whole, uh, you know, women in ministry thing after that, after it's done, whenever that's done. And I don't know if I'll teach it in one video or five videos or what. I, I don't have a plan yet. I have hundreds of pages of notes and I've got to think about how to boil it all down when the time comes. Still have a lot more work to do on it. Um, and uh, it'll be ready when it's ready. The, um, uh, the thing is, though, after that's done, I'm going to do the book of Hebrews. And I'm very excited to do that. I appreciate verse by verse teaching more than anything else. In, uh, in the stuff that I do. I love teaching verse by verse and that's can't wait to get back into the book of Hebrews and do that with you guys. In the meantime, I'm mostly just going to be doing stuff uh, on Fridays. Although I do have like um, a conference coming up and a couple, a couple conference type events coming up in the next couple months. I'll tell you guys more about that next week though. And I'll give you links if you're interested in maybe attending in person. So that's it. That's all I got. Take care. Drink coffee.